Lord, your name truly is powerful. And as we open your word today, we ask that you will help us, that we may see a picture of you through your word and through the life of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It was art time in Vacation Bible School, the time that the teacher liked the best because it gave her a little break from leading out up front. How many of you have ever been involved in Vacation Bible School? Yes, a lot of you. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Well, the teacher was enjoying Vacation Bible School, but she decided to do something a little different. Today, instead of having a little craft or something that she was going to do, she decided to hand all of the kids a blank sheet of paper, just nothing on it, and a bunch of crayons. And then she told them, you just draw a picture of whatever you want, anything you want. So the kids got together and started drawing their pictures, and the teacher began to walk around the room. Now, normally, I like to have kids in here, and they're always going something. I like to go up and see, what kind of pictures are you drawing? And that's what the teacher did. She was looking around the room. And over here were Billy and Bobby, and they're just typical boys. They're drawing pictures of cars and planes. You know, even when we get old, we never grow up, do we, fellas? We still think about cars and planes. And she continued to walk around the room, and she came to Susie and Sally. And Susie was drawing a picture of a doll. Common. But when she looked at Sally's picture, she didn't recognize it. So she looked again. And finally she said, Sally, what are you drawing a picture of? And Sally said, I'm drawing a picture of God. <laughs> well, the teacher was taken aback. She says, Sally, you can't draw a picture of God. Nobody knows what God looks like. And I love Sally's answer. She responded, they'll know when I get finished. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen her picture of God because she was sure when you saw her picture, you would see God. I want to ask you a question. What's your picture of God? If you were to draw a picture of God, what would it look like? Well, I'll have to confess that for me, my picture of God has changed over the years. <laughs> I can remember as a kid growing up and going through church school and everything, sometimes I would go to bed at night and I was still fearful. Oh, is there some mistake I haven't confessed or whatever? I saw God as that stern, aloof, judging God who's keeping track of all of my rights and wrongs. wrongs. And so that was my picture of God. But I'm glad to say that as I've grown older and I've got to know God better, my picture of God has greatly changed. There's a, uh, a gospel song, and I'm a big gospel music fan, so you'll have to forgive me. But I don't sing, so you'll get it. But it tells the story of a church who got a new pastor. And on his first, the, sermon, uh, the song says Sunday, on his first sermon on Sunday, the new pastor stood up, he opened the Bible, and then he said, love, love, love. <coughs> Closed his Bible and sat down. People were buzzing. Never heard such a short sermon. What kind of a man did we get? But yet, this pastor had realized the essence of God. Amen. Love. And if we focus on love, we will see God. 
And I want to share with you, if you'll open your Bibles to John chapter 14, very familiar uh, verses to us. John 14, 1 to 3, we've all memorized. In our Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But I want us to look at the next few verses. Uh, verse 4, Jesus says to them, and remind, remember, the setting for this passage of Scripture is the Last Supper. It's just Jesus and the disciples there around that table. And he says to them, you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Can you imagine that? One of the disciples at the end of Christ's ministry after three plus years of being with him and walking with him and seeing all that Christ had done, he says, hey, where are you going? I don't know where you're going. And Jesus answered him and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. We want to see the Father. We've seen you, Jesus. We want to see the Father. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been here among you such a long time, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Oh, that's the key. If you want to see what God's like, look at Jesus. In essence, in today's vernacular, uh, we could say, Jesus was a chip off the old block. Yeah? He looked like his Father. And that's what everybody used to say of me. If you look at me, I'm the spitting image of my father. Short, fat, a little fat, round, full face. And even when my dad passed away at 87 years of age, he still had tinges of original color in his hair. He wasn't totally white gray. And when I would go visit dad down in Tennessee, where he was retired, uh, people would see me and they would say, you must be Joe Green's son. You look just like him. And that's what Jesus is saying. Look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now today I want us to look at two pictures of God from the life of Christ. The first of those is found in John chapter 2. Very familiar story to us all. It's the wedding at Cana. Starting with verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And then Jesus' is strange response says, Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. Now it's interesting, this little interchange. I like when I read the scripture and I try to put myself right into it. What's happening here? Oh, Christ has gone to a wedding. It's a social event. In fact, in the Jewish life, it's the most important social event in the life of a family, the wedding. And weddings were big deals. They weren't just one day we're going to go on Sunday to the wedding and then there will be a brief reception and whew, we can get out of here now. No, it's a whole week. The whole village is invited. Come, party with us. We are going to fellowship together. 
So what's our first picture? It's a social setting. The first picture of God I want you to see is that God is a social God. Oh, he wants to be there. If you're having a birthday, invite him to the party. He will come and he will celebrate with you. Graduation, whatever the occasion, Jesus wants to be there with you. He wants to socialize with you. Be a part of you and whatever is important to you. That's the picture we need to see of God. We don't need to be afraid of God as a, an aloof God, far off, way away, and doesn't care about us. He says, if it's important to you, it's important to me. Invite me, I'll come. And so Jesus is there with his disciples at the wedding. They have a problem, and Mother Mary is still the mother. Reminds me a little of my mother. <laughs> When I was a kid growing up, mother uh, always had plans for us as kids. She wanted us to be a success and everything. In fact, she wanted me to be a pastor. And I was, as a little kid, I was scared to death to get up front. Just as afraid as could be. I couldn't get up there for love nor money. Whenever 13th Sabbath came and we had the... Uh, memory verses and all the kids divisions came in I knew all my memory verses mom made sure I memorized them all I knew them but when I would get up front I'd get stage fright my mind would go blank and I couldn't remember any of them I'd look out there and I'd see all of those people <sighs> I hope I'm going to be able to make it and survive this something's going to happen to me but yet mom insisted, you can do it. And she kept pushing me, kind of like a mother bird pushes the little baby bird out of the nest to get it to fly. And this is Mother Mary. She's pushing Jesus. Mary remembers 30 years before when that angel had come to her and said, you're going to have a son and he's going to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And she's ready for Jesus to start acting like the Messiah. Come on. We want you, Jesus, to do something to help us. We have a problem here. And Jesus said, no, it's not my time. It's not my time. But you know, Mary's just like my mother was. She doesn't take no for an answer. She doesn't argue with Jesus. Instead, what does she do? Verse 5, the mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> All right, now he's got to act, huh? <laughs> now he's got to act. Mom, you're pushing me further than I wanted to go. That's all right, son. Y'all just do whatever he tells you. It's interesting. These little tidbits that God puts in his word, why? To show us that Jesus is human just like you and I. He faced the same challenges growing up as we face. He had a mother who wanted him to reveal himself. Who wanted him to come forward and do something. And so you know the story. Jesus tells the servants there, fill these stone water jars with water. Now, this is interesting. The scripture says, and I'm not going to read all of those little details of the verses. The scripture says there were six of them. Every one of them held from 20 to 30 gallons of water. Can you imagine that? That's one big party. <laughs> 20 to 30 gallons of water that Jesus has them put into this. And then... He tells them after they're full, now follow protocol. What's the protocol? Oh, you have a master of ceremonies of the banquet. The one who's in charge to make sure everything is okay. And so Jesus says, now take some to the master of the banquet. Let him taste it. And when the master of the banquet tastes it, Wow! 
This is the best wine we have ever seen and I've ever tasted. And so he calls the bridegroom over. Psst, psst, come here. You should have served this first while people's taste buds were fresh. Not now, after they've been drinking for a day or two. Oh. But you know what? There's a lesson in this for you and I. What's the lesson? God doesn't make cheap wine. <laughs> he doesn't make cheap wine. <laughs> and he doesn't make cheap experiences in your life. Only the best will do. And so when God gets involved at this wedding, he makes the best wine that this host has ever tasted. And he can tell it instantly because it is far superior to anything he'd ever tasted. And that's God. And that's God for you. God wants you to have the best. And he says, invite me to the wedding. I'll come. I'll be your social friend. And everything is going to be good. Because I want you to have the best. Amen. What a picture of God. A social God. Have you ever thought of God that way? As, as someone who, who wanted to be around us. Wanted to come to the party. Wanted to, to celebrate with us. Wanted us to enjoy life. There is a quotation from uh, Ellen White in Desire of Ages on this experience here that I would like to just share with you briefly. It says here, The example of Christ in leaking himself with the interest of humanity should be followed by all who preach his word and by all who have received the gospel of his grace. Ah, that's you and I. This is not just for Pastor Messina who preaches the word. It's for you and I because we have received the grace of God. Amen. We are not to renounce social communion. Not to renounce social communion. We should not seclude ourselves from others. In order to reach all classes, we must meet them where they are. Where they are. That's page 152. And then she goes on to say, we should become witnesses for Jesus. Social power sanctified by the grace of Christ must be improved in the winning of souls to the Savior. Let the world see that we are not selfishly absorbed in our own interests but that we desire to sh others to share our blessings and privileges. Let them see that our religion does not make us unsympathetic or exacting. Let us all, let all who profess to have found Christ minister as he did for the benefit of men. And then this next little sentence or so here. We should never give to the world the false impression that Christians are gloomy, unhappy people. If our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we shall see a compassionate Redeemer and shall catch light from His countenance. Whenever His Spirit, wherever His Spirit reigns, there peace abides, and there will be joy also, for there is a calm Holy trust in God. Pages uh, 152 and 153. So is your religion gloomy? Are you an isolationist who wants to be withdrawn? That's not the way Christ was. He went to the wedding. Well, today, tomorrow he might go to the Super Bowl party in your neighborhood or something or another. Huh? He's a social God. He wants... You to know, if it interests you, I'm interested in it. Within realms, of course. You don't go off to, into areas that are, that are wrong, but he wants you to socialize. He wants you to mingle with people for their benefit. Joyce and I recently retired, and uh, 
we moved to Smyrna, Delaware. Where in the world is Smyrna? Well, it's a little town just north of Dover. And we picked a 55 plus community to live in. Because I didn't want to continue to have to shovel snow and cut the grass and all of this. I mean, after all, I'm an old man. It's time to, to slow down a little. So we, we got in this 55 plus community. And you know the best thing about this community? There's not another Adventist in it. Not a single Adventist in this community. Except for Joyce and I. And so we got to thinking, all right, so what are we going to do? How are we going to be able to be a witness? Well, the first thought that came to our mind was that we would go to the community events, the social events. And so the fourth Friday of every month, from 4 o'clock Friday afternoon until 7 o'clock Friday evening, it's happy hour. <laughs> and it's B-Y-O-B. Bring your own beverage. <laughs> and there's a lot of them that bring beer. Yes. Well, Joyce and I do too. We bring root beer. <laughs> but we go. And we are there with them on Friday afternoon. Socializing with them and being a witness to the community just by being part of it. Now when it gets to the winter time here, it's a little bit of a problem because sundown comes at about 4.15, 4.30 and everything. So Joyce and I have opted during the Sabbath hours to not go. But they know it. They recognize it. And they know uh, what it's like that uh, Joyce and Jim Green don't come on Friday afternoons after sundown. But it was interesting. I never told anyone that I was a pastor, a retired pastor. Never told them that. But here, a few months ago, after we'd been there for about, what, two years, Joyce, uh, <clears throat> one of the individuals spoke to me, and she said, are you a pastor? You just seem like a pastor. <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I'm a retired pastor. And uh, the guy in the subdivision who kind of organizes all these social events and everything, uh, I help him set up stuff for our block parties and all of those type of things because most of them aren't during Sabbath. But when he scheduled this last year, Cinco de Mayo, which happened to fall on a Sabbath, and we were having a, a block party in the, in the park in the subdivision there, uh, I said, Frank, I'm not going to be able to come because it's my Sabbath. And he says, I understand, Jim. He's a very... Uh, active Christian, openly post on Facebook spiritual messages almost every day, a different passage of scripture. Amen. The other thing that we did, we got involved, I did because I'm a workaholic, I'll confess to it, having been a retired secretary and treasurer of conferences and organizations, I'm a workaholic. So I put my name into the hat to serve on the advisory board for the Homeowners Association. And I got selected. <laughs> Even more than that, <laughs> I'm the secretary, so I have to take all the minutes. <laughs> and that has been a blessing to me because as we distribute the minutes, through the neighborhood, because of the finances, we don't pay for postage. 
we deliver them door to door. And so all the members of the advisory board, we take sections of the neighborhood and we go door to door. We meet everybody in person and here's your minutes for this month's advisory board meeting to keep them in fault. You have any questions? Come talk to us. It's been marvelous the experiences we've had of being able to interact with the community. Be social, my friends. Don't be aloof. Don't be withdrawn. You don't have to start out by preaching to them. Just live a Christian life. Just show that you care for them and others will see Jesus in you. Now we want to look right quick at the second picture of, of God that Jesus painted for us because remember, who gives us the picture of God? Jesus. If you have seen Jesus, you've seen God. John chapter 8. Oh, this is a familiar chapter to all of us. You know the story. Jesus had been out on the Mount of Olives, and in verse 2, John chapter 8, verse 2, at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Did you notice what did Jesus did? He sat down. The scriptures numerous times refer to Christ as sitting, talking to the people, not standing up front and preaching. What happens when you sit down? Your eye to eye. It puts you at ease. You can feel comfortable. Hey, this guy's approachable. And he has something. I want to listen and see what he... So Jesus sits there on the steps of the temple teaching the people, meeting them at eye level, getting close to them. And as Jesus is talking to them, what happens? You know the story. <laughs> the religious leaders and the Pharisees, they drag in this woman caught in the act of adultery, and they bring her right down the aisle and plunk her down on the ground, right in front of Jesus. And then they start quoting scripture. <laughs> the Bible says we should stone her. That's true. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. You're going to find it there. But there's a problem. The problem is, the Bible also says the man should be stoned too. Not just the woman. They were discriminating. You can't have adultery without two parties. <laughs> and so therefore, God says, both parties should be stoned. But the Jewish leaders are trying to test Jesus. And what's the test? Well, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And if you're the Son of God, and the Bible says, stone him, then you would uphold the Word of God, wouldn't you? Because God says, I change not. And so they said, the Bible says, Stone them. What do you say? But on the other hand, things are different now. When that passage in Deuteronomy was given, who was in charge of the nation? Oh, God was. It was a theocracy under God. He was still leading the children of Israel out there in the desert. And he was trying to establish for these ex-slaves, this is how you live. And so he gave all kinds of rules. Well, you had to have not only the Ten Commandments, which he put in writing. You had to have civil laws. You had to have sanitary laws. You had to have dietary laws. All of this to bring these slaves into the ability to function and work as a nation, as a community of God, led by God and a nation who was on the same page together. 
And so therefore, he had given all of these laws and regulations for the betterment of the Hebrew children, those slaves, so that they could be organized and be a great nation. And so now, who's ruling the nation? Jesus is here now. He's sitting there on the steps of the temple. And who's in charge of the government? Rome. Oh. So you mean that some things are kind of conditional on some of the circumstances around? Rome is in charge. And if Jesus had said, stone her, then they would have reported him to the Roman authorities because the Jews no longer had authority over the civil affairs of the Jewish community. Only over the religious, but not over the civil. They could not make those life and death decisions. They could make recommendations, but Rome had to carry it out. Not Jesus and not the Jews. And so they thought they had the perfect trap for Jesus. Yeah. If he says, don't stone her, he's denying the word of God. If they say, stone her, then he's violating civil law because it's the Romans who, Romans who have the authority to carry out the capital punishment decisions. But Jesus does something very interesting. Sometimes when I would, uh, in conference administration, and I was uh, dealing with some churches that were having some church fights and things that we sometimes do, uh, you have to figure out a way to get people to communicate and bridge the gap. And sometimes the best answer is silence. And what happens? Jesus doesn't respond to them, but instead he stoops down and he starts to write in the sand. That's all. They're still standing there. The poor woman is right there in front of him, caught in the act. She's embarrassed. They're asking for her life. And Jesus is silent. He's just writing. And these religious leaders become impatient. And they start pushing Jesus. you got to do something. What you could do? So Jesus stands up. And he tells them, He who is without sin can cast the first stone. Oh, so you've got to be sinless to judge life and death matters, huh? It's God that makes that decision, not you. And then he's down and he's writing again. And these religious leaders, they go up and they say, what in the world is he writing? And they start looking at it. Whoops, I think I better get out of here. And you know, Jesus knew who was the oldest and who was the youngest. And he started with the oldest and he started writing personal messages to those leaders. He knew their hearts, and he was writing personal messages to them. And as they look at it, they start slipping away. Slipping away. And then, after a little bit, they're all gone. You know what I'm happy about? The Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote. It, yes, it doesn't say Jim Green did this, Paulo Messino did this, Jonathan did this, Terry, you did this, and Joy, you did this. No, those were personal messages directed to each of us individually, to our hearts. We know our hearts and we know our relationship. Instead, Jesus wipes the slate and he doesn't leave it there for everybody else to come up and read. Oh, what a God. Can you imagine that? Here are these church leaders trying to trap him. They want to be able to get him crucified. And what does Jesus do? In his love and grace and mercy, 
He wipes the slate clean. He doesn't hang yours and our dirty laundry out for everybody to see. That's not the way Jesus is. He's a loving, caring God. He wiped the slate clean. There is nothing written in stone there for the ages, like the Ten Commandments when God wrote with his finger that time. It's wiped clean. And they're allowed to go on their way to allow the Holy Spirit to work in their life as to what their future will be. What a God. Amen. Now everybody's gone. I mean, all of the church leaders are gone. The Pharisees and the religious teachers, they're gone. And here's this poor woman. When she was brought in, and when she heard those religious leaders quote scripture and say, the Bible says stoner, she knew that she deserved to be stoned. She knew she was guilty. And so Jesus turns to her, and Ellen White tells us she fully expected the stones would start to fly. But instead, Jesus asked her a question. So here's, who's here to condemn you? Where's your witnesses? And she looks around. No one, Lord, no one is here. And then he said the most beautiful words to this woman. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now notice what Jesus did not say to this woman. He did not say to her, you're guilty. And he did not say to her, you're not guilty. Because she was guilty. She knew it. He knew it. What he said was, I don't condemn you. Do you realize that's the business of Christ? He's not in the condemnation business. He's in the salvation business. He wants your life to be touched by his to see something different. He knows, I'm sorry, see something different. He knows all our mistakes. He knows what each of our lives are. Like. But the good news is, he's got it covered. Hey, I've got you covered. Don't worry about your past. My friends, if there are some of you who are sitting here today and you're still thinking in your mind, oh, I still think of something I did that I shouldn't have done. It doesn't matter what it is. Take it to the Lord and leave it there. Don't keep carrying it around. If you truly accept Christ as your personal Savior and His grace for you and what he has done, you can have the assurance that he will cover your sins Amen. as long as you stay committed to him. Amen. So two pictures of God that we've looked at today. The social God who says, invite me, I want to come. I want to be part. I'll come to dinner at your house. I don't care whether it's lasagna today are Chinese. Just invite me. I will be there. I will fellowship with you. And then the picture of God who says, look, I'm a gracious, loving, forgiving, caring God. Amen. When you go back and you read John 3, 16, too many of us stop right there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we don't go on to verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what living the Christian life is all around, about. That's what it's like to paint a picture of God in your life. Can others see Jesus in you? It is my prayer that for each one of us, we will determine within our lives, Lord, let your love, your grace, your mercy show through me to others that they can see Jesus 
in me. Oh, Lord, how great you truly are. You have saved us. You've shown us what your life is like through your son, Jesus. And now, Lord, I pray that you will bless us as we leave this church, that we can show Jesus to everyone we come in contact with by the love and the kindness, the joy and the happiness that flows from our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.